we use this. Okay. So hello everyone. Um, the topic today will be about the Data Hub uh, project. Uh, that is a pet project of mine. But I have this um, WordPress um, website. You can see here that this is the homepage uh, of the website or the, or the project. This is the URL. And um, here you can, well, as you can see, you can uh, check out different uh, aspects of the projects like feature specs and uh, roadmap for future uh, development and news. Uh, well, the only news here that it has been launched, it's from early February. And um, yeah, that's about it. And the actual project I would like to show is available on a different link. I would rather open it in a new tab that we can uh, go back and forth if needed. So I will open it in a new tab. So quickly about the project itself. Um, so as you could quickly see and we'll see here, it's based on Jupyter Hub. And uh, well, the title of the meetup itself is uh, about uh, reusable and shareable notebooks. And in case this means uh, Jupyter notebooks. So behind all this is a Jupyter Hub instance running on a server, natively installed uh, by me. And uh, every user will have uh, a separate Docker container. So it's a all the notebooks uh, will have or are running in a Docker container, and each container will have the same environment. Um, it's based on a custom image, and the UI that you will see is uh, called the Jupyter Lab UI, which is the up to date or more up to date uh, UI for Jupyter notebooks. But if you can see, I will show it to you. Um, if you are already familiar with Jupyter Notebooks and you would like to use the, the old uh, UI for it, it's still accessible inside. So that's briefly it. Um, as like I said it on the uh, project um, homes, uh, it's developed by me, but it's based on and built on uh, work of others, um, in, and in this case, the Jupyter project and uh, all the people who are working on it. So first of all, a big thanks to them. And uh, the implementation uh, in this case will uh, is mostly DevOps at the moment. So installing the project and, and making it run uh, properly. And uh, the future, uh, well, I will talk about the future later when we have seen what we currently have. This will be um, a rather shorter meetup. So back here, um, I have a really easy sign up and login. Um, it's nothing special. The authentication is really done locally. Uh, no extra uh, providers at the moment. Um, Jupyter Hub allows the usage of OAuth protocol, but it only allows uh, one provider at the moment, to best of my knowledge. And uh, I would like to find a way that allows uh, more than one or make it so. So um, for the sake of uh, ease of use, I decided to use a different kind of authentication, which is uh, a simple sign up. So you can sign up on the sign up form. You need a username and password, not even email. So there's no email verification. There is no uh, nothing at the moment, you just sign up and then you can immediately log back in. Well, I, you can see I have multiple accounts already for uh, admin, regular user, and for testing. And here I will just uh, log in with my usual one. And um, yep, it's booting up. So in the behind the scenes, um, there is a, a cloud server on a, a German hosting company, so it's not Google, not not uh, Microsoft Azure. It's not that kind of cloud. It's a, it's a Hetzner cloud server, but it's it's a private server in this case. Um, and it's a, right now it's a thin server, very limited resources, but it's enough to uh, serve a few um, users. 
And what you see here is my um, account and the JupyterLab um, interface, which is really nice. Um, if you haven't seen this already, um, then I would give you a quick tour still. So you can do uh, different things in here. Um, you can start notebooks uh, using Python 3 kernel and R kernel. So I have two kernels installed already. Um, you can use either. You can also start a console uh, using uh, the same two kernels, and then you can create a shell-like uh, window. It's, it's almost like a bash, but you don't really have um, um, like you don't have bash completion or, or auto completion. So this is like having a terminal on the on, in in the Docker instance. Um, so you are containerized or contained in your own instance of the of this notebook and or Docker container, and then you can do all kind of stuff here. So. That's, that's all built in by JupyterLab. Uh, the thing I added is the extra kernel, which is R. And the reason why I added it is uh, because if I check the readme, uh, I might just want to increase the oops, not this font size. Um, I might want to increase the editor font size a little bit. So. You can see JupyterLab is um, quite featureful or feature rich. It has really nice uh, UI. It's almost like an IDE within the browser, and I can make it not uh, bigger. So this is just a README. It's <laughs> the thing is, it's not uh, fully up to date because I have features um, that I couldn't uh, include here. But here you can see in the README um, here. That's the I think the most important, that you have a Python 3.7 kernel by a Python installed in it, and an R kernel with the by a con conductor uh, package manager. So if you want, you could in instantly start using those. Uh, well, with by a conductor, you would need to install the specific uh, packages you would want to use, because uh, I haven't yet installed anything, uh, anything, but the package manager is there. And BioPython, well, if you know already BioPython, then uh, you can start using it. If you don't know what it is, um, I suggest you look it up in the internet. Uh, briefly, it's a, it's a collection of libraries that um, meant to help people uh, do bioinformatic uh, stuff work. So it has uh, classes and methods uh, for like DNA, RNA sequences, converting into uh, different formats, and it even has some bindings to um, some common tools like uh, Clustal and uh, stuff like that. So yeah, we'll talk about this later. And in the meantime, I've also installed some other common packages like Matplot, Matplot at Plotlib, uh, Pandas, NumPy, so all the, all the usual stuff you would really start uh, doing all kinds of data science uh, or data related work in Python that's already inside here. Okay, so that's feature number one. And um, well, in the uh, later, uh, there might be other kernels. Um, I've not decided yet. So if you open a uh, notebook, you almost get something you would see in a classic notebook. If you haven't seen a classic notebook before, I, I will also show that in a moment. So here, um, notebooks can be used uh, quite easily. So you can have uh, cells in it, and, and those cells uh, can have code in it. So let's just do a very simple uh, print. Uh, and click. Okay. Right. And then you can execute it. That's it. So the notebooks themselves, the Jupyter notebooks, are, are very good uh, for having code and documentation all together. So um, 
um, you would have everything in one file and then you can separate um, cells like you can have markdown cells and then in markdown uh, you can have regular markdown syntax so this is just a markdown down and if you execute it it executes so um, Jupyter notebooks are very, very, very useful uh, for experimenting, uh, gradually building up your code and still have it uh, documented. It even uh, saves the, the output so you can see the, the result of the last run. So, um, but that's just notebooks as is. You could run them privately on your own machine and uh, that's it. You could host it or run it uh, locally on the browser, the Jupyter Notebooks, and have the same stuff. You can even install Jupyter Lab on your own local computer and have the same stuff. Why I have started this project is, um, is beyond what Jupyter offers on its own, and um, I'm going to talk about that. Well, the first uh, or number one reason why I've started this is that I have, in my experience, I've seen that um, there are a lot of tools out there. There are a lot of libraries. Each and everybody uses uh, their own favorite tool, favorite library with favorite version and dependencies. And because there are lots of small tools, if you think of BioPython or, or the other thing is Bioconda, um, it's not yet installed, but there's a plan to it to include some stuff from it. In Bioconda, you have seven and a half thousand packages. And well, it's not all related directly to bioinformatics. There are uh, packages for, for cloud providers and stuff like that. But all of those small packages have um, dependencies and those, if you want to include them one by one, you might get into a dependency hell. So that's what Bioconda did, uh, is that they made their own package or, or distribution of tool where you have the dependencies figured out. And I had the kind of the same idea, but I wanted to include as many things as possible and provide uh, a defined environment where everybody uses the same kernel, same set of tools, same version of tools, and the work you do would be easily shareable with others, and others can just take the notebook you do, you, you provide, you, you develop your whatever algorithm, and other people would like it, they would not need to adapt anything. They could just take that notebook and run it here, and it would work. And that's, that's the idea that you are not fiddling around with different versions of dependencies as in, as in, and it doesn't work for me, it works for you, but what versions do you have? So that's the idea behind this project that everybody works with the same thing and then it, everything works for everybody else. And for this, you, I don't know if you've noticed, but uh, if you haven't, then uh, take uh, a look at this piece of the UI here. You have different um, folders in your, inside the container. The private is, well, as it names to suggest, it's only for private stuff. So you can, you can save your, uh, you can see that I have a presentation in progress for a conference. So all the files you save here in the private folder will, be, um, will survive the container. So it's, it's persistent data, it's saved really to the server, to a separate folder, and it's, it's only yours. Uh, anything else here outside these folders um, is not fully persistent. It only uh, persists as long as the container persists. And um, during development and updates, it could happen that your containers uh, will be destroyed. So any data that's not saved into this folder will be lost. Uh, that's a side effect and I'm trying to perfect the, the method that it doesn't really happen uh, often. You, uh, you have here a so-called public folder 
which is also persistent. So anything you put here is uh, uh, survives the destruction of the container. And this public folder is meant is for files that you meant mean to share with others. So anything you put here will be visible to others. And I will uh, demonstrate that in a moment. And then you have a shared, uh, which is stuff from people from your public uh, folder and public uh, files from others. And uh, well, if I go back here and create a new file here, I'll close this. So I'll just make a markdown file and say, okay, hello, meetup and polka. Well, just polka. Okay, I save it here. Uh, well, I might just also rename it. So hello, meetup. Okay. Uh, it takes some while until the synchronization uh, is completed in the background. It's really done at the server level. So um, here in the shared folder, you will get a read-only copy of that publicly uh, shared um, file. And um, yeah. So, uh, and the reasoning behind it is that uh, if you want to use somebody else's notebook, you should really take a copy of it and play around it in your uh, environment and not possibly destroy other people's work. So, share folder is read only for you and for everybody else. Um, okay. Yes, you can see the hello meetup markdown file has arrived uh, in the meantime. And if I open it here, then it has the same. So I can close both and open it up, and it's the same. But here I would not be able to rename it possibly. So if I put a zero one, yep, I cannot rename it here, but uh, I could do it in the other one. So, and okay, I log out and log in with my test account and the test account, uh, this test user should also uh, have access from this. You see it's hello meetup. I, uh, so the other user also sees the stuff I have shared here. And um, well, that's, the, that's the main concept of it, that you can ha still have your private work uh, the way you want, but you can share it, you can share it with your colleagues. Uh, this whole thing will be open sourced hopefully this month and uh, with instructions how to set it up. So um, if you, you don't want to use this public uh, service, you would be able to set up this installation um, with the Docker containers, notebooks. You could run it in, in your lab, company, team of developers, uh, students in a classroom, and then everybody, you would have a local uh, installation of it and uh, on a private server and still be, people using the same server would still be able to share stuff with, you, with each other in the same environment and then um, you, can, you can use the same thing. It's also, well, it's a, it's, it's a tool for collaboration and yeah. Well, uh, a second feature of Jupyter Hub uh, is that it can launch servers that can be used by multiple users at the same time, which is not fully functional here, so it's not yet included. Uh, you only have single use uh, servers uh, at the moment, which means single user uh, Docker containers, but through this method I just showed, you can still uh, share work. And um, yeah, that's the that's the core functionality I have uh, at the moment. Um, this sharing functionality is, uh, as I said, so new it's it's not even in the README, and I would need to update documentation and, and I need to open source that whole thing. But it's already live. You can sign up. You can start working. You can do anything you want. And the future here. Um, 
because that's that's where the the actual development uh, would happen is to well first of all provide um, easy to use Jupyter notebooks for for common tasks so sort of best practices and uh, that's one of the reasons uh, I did this that I would really I would be happy if uh, professional users who are best in the field or 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 know how to do stuff really well would uh, would they share their uh, way of thinking and their best practices through Jupyter notebooks and that everybody could uh, do the same best practice because um, I've seen it many times uh, experienced it myself during my uh, lab years that um, well, if you think of regular work, there are several tasks that are kind of common in, in every lab, every work environment. Uh, we all do the same steps. We have to clean data, we have to do conversions and stuff. And sometimes you need some custom stuff that could be useful for uh, others. And this is where it starts uh, that everybody starts to build their own little tool for their one specific thing. And that's it. it nobody knows it. And if somebody gets uh, into the same uh, issue, he or she will do the same, but a little bit different. And it might not be as good as the other one. So the idea here is again collaboration and sharing uh, ideas, methods, and best practices. So that's uh, roadmap number, entry number one. Uh, maybe I have it uh, here, maybe not. Yeah, well, it's more uh, of a functional feature. So uh, roadmap entry uh, number one would be to provide uh, best uh, practices notebooks uh, shared so that everybody can use the same just dump in your data it will do its job or modify tweak it a little bit where you need to and then it will work so save you time by by giving you a sort of starter pack and the second is uh, one of the uh, main topics i like uh, is visualization of data and to my experience um Jupyter and, and or JavaScript has some, well, I would rather rephrase Python and in JavaScript, there are some uh, tools that uh, visualize some uh, data like multiple sequence alignments, dendrograms, uh, gene maps or whatever, but the, these are again, little, a few people project that who did it on their own and, and uh, uh, may not fit the needs of others or may not be fully complete or abandoned and what I would like to do here and it's it's currently active uh, development by one of our students um, Becky basically uh, who is um, <clears throat> thesis project is doing uh, multiple sequence alignments um, and dendrograms with uh, bokeh so the the second entry in the roadmap is providing widgets or, or, or notebooks that can visualize the data you have um, in a good way, in an interactive way. If you know Bokeh, uh, well, most uh, Python visualizing library, uh, visualization libraries are quite interactive, so they offer a lot of interactivity. And well, if you know multiple sequence alignment, uh, then you know that like Clustal is two or three decades old. Um, it's not that uh, not that nice, so to say. And I would like to change that. That you can you can have a nice uh, view of your data and not just multiple sequence alignments, but other kinds of data. So uh, entry point two: a lot of uh, widgets and visualization for data. And um, yes, um, in Python, uh, you can, yeah. yes, sorry, I don't want to open a file here. I want, want it here. Thank you. So um, I, if you didn't know already, um, with Python, you can execute um, uh, command line tools. So I could, from this cell, I could issue a bash command ls with this 
uh, cell magic uh, exclamation mark. And if you have a lot of common line tools, um, and you will have a lot of common line tools here pre-installed for you uh, once I get there, you could just use them from the from the Jupyter notebook like this. But then um, it it would be almost the same as as using it from from a terminal from a command line. The one thing better is that it's embedded in your notebook, so any data magic you do on in previous cells, you can still include it here. Uh, and it will be fed to the common line tool if needed. But it's, it's still not the best way. And uh, a lot of people don't like to use or don't know well how to use uh, common line tools and parameters. Uh, sometimes it's just much easier to use uh, a GUI. But not all tools have uh, GUIs, unfortunately. So the third entry on the roadmap will be providing um, a sort of GUI for these tools, either in the form of uh, widgets or uh, in a form of uh, notebooks, basically, which you can import and or uh, uh, put parameters into. So long story short, the third point is basically um, making it easier to use all these tools uh, through this uh, UI and, and interface. And uh, yeah, there will be uh, more. Uh, one of them is when, as soon as the feature uh, becomes available in Jupyter Lab, I would like to have that. Uh, you can actually have presentations um, here. And well, I will just um, give a trailer, um, so to say. OK. So you can have really nice presentations from a Jupyter notebook with an extension, which you already have installed here. And I will have it here. So unfortunately, it does not really work well with the Jupyter Lab interface. Um, you, can, you can convert a notebook into an HTML file, basically, that would serve as your presentations. And you can navigate it through interactively. But in the lab interface, it it's not fully functional. But um, you can launch the classic notebook view here. And this is how Jupyter notebooks uh, looked like uh, a few years ago. And you can still navigate to the file here. And uh, as I open it, and I have here an Alt-R. It's, it's the Rise extension. And then you have a really nice presentation here in the, in the browser. And it's all through the service. So uh, you could, again, you could do the same thing um, locally on your own. But since you, we are here, why not do it here? So that's a little extra hack or extra feature that you can do this. Uh, and you can use all the data that's available on the server. So, and basically that's, if you don't like the lab interface, you can always uh, switch to this um, older interface. Okay. So that uh, is basically what I wanted to show you uh, about this. Um, as I said, it will be a, a rather short uh, introduction to the project. And this is what I could have uh, done um, on my own in my free time. It's really in the evenings and on the weekends uh, when I have a little time. But I would like to invite uh, everybody uh, to contribute uh, to this uh, project. As I said, it will be open sourced uh, and then um, with instructions how to install it, instructions how to contribute. And um, you can have their feature requests. So that's also a com contribution to have feature requests and bug reports, uh, because that also tells me or us, depending on how many people will be there, uh, what to look out for, what's the way we should really think. And um, I would like to uh, thank you for attention, and um, in, both in the video and in live. And in line, uh, there's time for questions. So. I will just uh, stop the recording here.
because that's it. Okay. And now stop.